Uh, we wanted to show you um, some results uh, from the overall exam. Uh, you can see that uh, question six, uh, not surprisingly, was the lowest scoring question. All AP exam uh, questions on the statistics test are scored from zero to four. Uh, so the tortilla question was 1.08. Uh, then number two was the second lowest, 1.23. Number four was the third lowest, 1.52. Uh, and then question three, the probability question, 1.70. And then two, basically, data analysis questions, uh, five and one, uh, both scored quite high relative to uh, previous exams, uh, both scoring uh, with an average greater than two. Uh, and then you can see the exam scores, uh, the distribution of ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives. Uh, pretty typical um, based on previous years. Um, you can see that there's a little bit of a spike there at the ones. Uh, lots of students take the test and turn in funny pictures and leave blank exams, and so um, that's why we see more ones than you expect uh, based on the other scores. All right, uh, so that's been results from the 2015 AP Statistics exam. Uh, you see uh, Darren and my email address. Uh, we'd be happy to take uh, questions or comments uh, after the webinar at those email addresses. Uh, but now we'd like to uh, open it up for questions um, uh, for either of us. And uh, I think Nicole has been fielding questions in the chat, uh, and maybe we'll uh, pass those along. So we've had three questions come in so far. Um, anyone else that has questions, please feel free to send them to me in the chat, and I will um, ask them in the order in which they're received. So the first, one's for, um, the first one is from Corinne. She says, my students are often confused with the difference between cluster and stratified, stratified sampling. This is a common topic on the exam. How do you clear up this confusion with your students? This is Josh. I'll take, I'll take this one if you want, and maybe Darren could take the next one. Um, okay. So uh, both uh, stratified and cluster sampling are sort of different ways to, to get a random sample from a population that's different than a simple random sample. Um, I think that the best way to describe the differences is their purpose. Um, for a stratified random sample, uh, the purpose is to uh, get a, a more precise estimate of the mean or the proportion or whatever it is you're trying to estimate. Um, and you can do that by uh, carefully um, dividing the population into strata that are expected to give similar responses. Uh, so the best variables to use for stratification are the ones that would be good predictors of how people or the units would respond. So the goal there is increased precision. For cluster sampling, uh, the goal is uh, a more efficient data collection. Um, if you were to take a, a simple random sample, for example, of 100 students from your school, uh, you might have to walk around all day or all week just to try and track down 100 students. Uh, but if you form clusters based on location, uh, for example, you know, there might be 25, 30, 35 students in each classroom. Uh, you might only randomly choose three classrooms and go visit those three classrooms and survey everybody in those rooms. Um, and that would make your uh, sampling uh, a lot more efficient. Uh, now, there's drawbacks to both types as well. Um, but basically, the, the key distinction is uh, the goal of, how you're try uh, of what you're trying to do with the sampling either get a more precise estimate or to make your data collection more efficient. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is actually about question four, so I'll direct this one to Darren. This is from Kenneth A. Can students name the appropriate procedure in, in step three on question four? Uh, yes, absolutely. AP readers don't distinguish where on the paper uh, the student is providing the name of the procedure. Uh, so if they put uh, two sample z-tests for a difference in proportion, or two prop z-tests, or uh, anything that's equivalent to that in words or in formula um, format, um, then that's considered as identifying the uh, task. So they can put it as part of uh, whatever organizational structure they use. Uh, I just find that the four-step process that we know the rubric is going to follow is, is uh, probably the easiest thing for my students to use when I'm setting it up for them. So, so my students will identify the procedure in step two by name, and uh, most of my students will use the calculator to do step three. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Corinne. 
Do you recommend to your students that they show the calculations for the test statistics for an inference question, or do you recommend that they just use the calculator? Well, I may have just given that one away a little bit. I'd be curious to hear Josh's answer, but I do not like to show the form. I feel like they're under time pressure and they're better off um, just using stat tests. Okay. Uh, I would agree with that. Uh, the same thing would be true for confidence intervals. Uh, now, I'm talking about uh, an exam tip, right, what they're going to actually do on the AP exam. Uh, when I start teaching the inference chapters, uh, chapters 8 for confidence intervals and 9 for uh, significance tests, I do encourage students to um, be f uh, familiar and comfortable using the formulas. Um, you'll see that that would have helped students on question 2 uh, when they had to work on the margin of error. Uh, if they're comfortable with the formula and recognized how it worked, um, they would have had uh, an easier time with that. Uh, so I do introduce the formulas. Um, I do encourage students to use the formulas uh, early on uh, when they tend to be simpler uh, when we're doing one sample procedures. Uh, but as we transition to two sample procedures and then certainly inference for slope, um, I start relying on the calculator more. Uh, and by the time we get to the AP exam, I do encourage my students on the free response to uh, use their calculators to get the test statistic and p-value uh, or the endpoints of the confidence interval. And the next question comes from Jamie. Were there a lot of deductions for calculator talk on the exam this year? Uh, this is Josh again. Um, I don't think so. Um, there, uh, you know, calculator um, notation or calculator talk, calculator talk is okay uh, as long as it's properly annotated. Um, the, the philosophy is uh, that I tell my students, as long as um, somebody who's never used a graphing calculator is able to understand uh, what you're trying to communicate, then it's fine. Um, so there weren't necessarily like a, a, a standard normal question, normal distribution question on this year's exam. Um, but if there was, you know, students can use normal CDF as long as they clearly label the lower bound, the upper bound, the mean, and the standard deviation. Uh, and that's generally been true um, throughout the years of the exam, uh, even though it's maybe not well advertised uh, on rubrics. So short answer to your question is no, I don't remember uh, any particular um, or lots of deductions for calculator notation on this year's exam. Uh, and again, a more general answer is that it's fine to use that as long as it's clearly communicated. Uh, so someone who's never used that particular graphing calculator uh, would be able to understand completely what's going on. Um, the next question is coming from Matt. For question 60, would students have received credit for, for saying the shape of the distribution is symmetric, or did they have to say it was approximately normal? Uh, they did have to say that it was approximately normal or something equivalent, like drawing a normal curve or saying, you know, bell-shaped and symmetric. Uh, the reason why symmetric alone did not earn credit uh, was because the population uh, was symmetric itself, but it was bimodal. Uh, and so we needed to know that kids uh, transferred the bimodal population into a sampling distribution that was not bimodal, uh, but approximately normal. Um, one more question from Lou. Thank you for this presentation. In question four, one condition was checked by seeing if the number of expected value was large enough as opposed to an explicit comparison of greater than some numbers, would you please expand on the idea of the use of a large, general large enough criterion? Uh, sure, this is Darren again. Um, when students are trying to check that condition that's related to using the, uh, the normal calculation to find the p-value, we need to be sure that they're uh, checking something about the count of successes and failures in the problem. And the students have to explicitly state what that criterion is. Uh, in most of the textbooks now, the criterion is that the, uh, the counts have to be at least uh, 10, or possibly there are still some books that say that uh, for a two-sample test that the counts need to be uh, all at least five. That's the counts of successes and failures in both groups. Um, we're not too persnickety about whether students are checking the, uh, the observed counts or some kind of expected count that's calculated on the, uh, the pool for compliance proportion. Uh, but we do want to know what their criterion is. 
and they have to explicitly state it in order for us to give it credit. Just saying the counts are large enough, um, students shouldn't count on that being enough. They need to give a value, a cutoff. Thank you. Those are all the questions we've received. Um, does anyone have any more questions that they'd like to ask live? Um, we are receiving a question to look at slide 17 again. All right, slide 17. I'll make that happen. Whoops, let's not do it that way. Let's do it this way. Take a second, yeah. There we go, slide 17. Um, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? Oh, it looks like no one has any more questions. I do want to say once again that um, I know a couple of people unfortunately joined a little late or halfway through. So um, I will be sending out a recording to you by the end of the week, um, possibly Monday. Um, with a link to our YouTube channel, I highly encourage you go to youtube.com um, slash BSW High School. Darren and Josh have done a ton of wonderful professional development videos just like this. And all of the recordings are up on, the, up on our YouTube page. So you can watch last year's version of this presentation that looked at the 2014 exam and other, um, you know, anything else that you'd like to see. Um, if you have any questions, last call for questions. All right, everyone's just saying thank you in the chat. So um, thank you once again to Darren and Josh for putting this together. Um, you all should have my email address, and I highly encourage all of you to email me at endofdiato at dswpub.com. If you don't have it, I will be emailing you with the recording within the next few days. Um, other than that, I hope you guys all have a wonderful evening. Um, and happy Halloween. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.